And first of all, thank you to you and, and the Recyclers people for um, taking the initiative and, and arranging this, this workshop uh, for all of us. I think that's a, a good thing. And I will just share. It should be here. Yes. Do you see? Very well. <clears throat> well, first of all, the, uh, the the title of the course, non-battery, is something that is nice sometimes. Uh, us hydrogen people are under some pressure from the, the battery sector. The battery vehicles are uh, pushing against the hydrogen vehicles. So that's a kind of, of creative competition. So sometimes it's nice to, to focus on the, the non-battery concepts. Uh, so so uh, that, that I, I, I do appreciate. <clears throat> well, next uh, AEC is about uh, alkaline electrolysis. Uh, we are developing new materials uh, to make uh, what we call the next generation of alkaline electrolysis. Uh, it started in April last year and it's going to last for four years. And um, the partners here are uh, several universities and research institutions, but also uh, a few uh, industries. And that is the Blue World Technologies that we have already seen appearing as a logo. Uh, it's an, a fuel cell company, but they are also involved in electrolysis. And then we have Nell Hydrogen, the Norwegian, uh, one of the leading companies uh, in, uh, in electrolysis uh, with the uh, Basically, they have continued the tradition from a North Kyoto with large-scale alkaline electrolysis, but today they are also a, a addressing chem electrolysis. Uh, yes, and the idea here is that we should uh, try to develop uh, new alkaline electrolysis uh, with the performance comparable to that of the PEM electrolyzer. We believe we can do that. Uh, we'll uh, not rely on noble metals. Uh, all uh, electrodes and all components should be made with all without any noble metals. Uh, we do that by means of a new uh, membrane concept that I'll briefly explain during this talk. And uh, it's a non-porous membrane, uh, but we believe it can be as thin as an ion exchange membrane. So just an alternative to the ion exchange membrane that many groups are trying to develop these years. Uh, we are upscaling the components to a degree where we can do a demonstration in the, in the nail electrolyzer. And uh, this, the, the, the motivation behind this is, of course, to improve the technology and the rate capability, but also to have a fully scalable technology that we can take to, to the uh, multi megawatt, even the terawatt level. Very briefly, we have heard uh, about the importance of energy storage and electrolysis, uh, but to tell the same st story uh, with a few numbers, uh, I'll do this uh, justification of, of the need for electrolysis. Uh, the solar influx to planet Earth is about 10,000 times the global uh, present need of, of energy. And, and, and some estimations say that it's more than a thousand times the part that the potential of the part that we can actually harvest and utilize is over a thousand times the, the, the global need. Likewise, the wind potential also exceeds the, the global energy need uh, by a few times. Uh, biomass, the third large uh, resource for renewable energy, is uh, quite a lot smaller. Uh, there are also many different estimations of that, but the general impression is that it does not uh, match the, the need for the transport sector. And that is where it's most critical because you cannot uh, run the whole transport sector by, by batteries. So there is a need for, for fuels for at least for some parts of the transport sector. Think of uh, aviation and, and, and cargo shipping and so on. The total power use at, at planet Earth is around 18 terawatts. So you can imagine since these major sources in a green uh, energy system uh, are all uh, fluctuating, uh, at least the uh, wind and solar, which are by far the largest, uh, will need uh, energy storage in the terawatt scale. The transport sector amounts to around five terawatts. And again, the need for fuel here will be also in the terawatt range. So the conversion of electricity into matter uh, is uh, tremendous. And, 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 and we need to address that uh, somehow. If you look at the three 
uh, electrolyzer uh, families. Uh, we have the, the alkaline electrolyzer in, in, in orange and the uh, light blue PEM electrolyzer and the solid oxide electrolyzer in purple. In this graph, we have in the primary axis the, the, the current density of, of, the, of the electrolyzer. Uh, and on the primary or secondary axis, we have the cell voltage. And the, the current density, that's basically how uh, the, the rate capability, how much can the a given electrolyzer produce uh, over time. And that would like to be as high as possible because that reduces the, the capital expenditure we can do with, with a smaller electrolyzer uh, system if it can produce more. So that is certainly attractive. On the other hand, if you increase the rate, uh, the cell voltage goes up and the cell voltage is a direct measure of the uh, conversion efficiency. The higher the cell voltage, the more energy we have to put into the process to drive up the, the, the hydrogen. The electrons that we supply will have to come with a higher current, or sorry, higher voltage. So that will uh, be more, more, uh, more energy. So if we increase the cell voltage, we lower the uh, energy efficiency and that lowers or uh, that increases the operating uh, expenditure. So we'd like a low cell voltage. So in this graph, you can see that the alkaline comes out the poorest and the solid oxide is by far the most efficient. Uh, the dotted red line is uh, the uh, thermoneutral potential with respect to liquid water. And that is the potential at which the uh, electrolyzer operates completely balanced. So all the energy we put into it is actually stored in the hydrogen comes out. So there's no waste heat uh, liberated from the electrolyzer. And the nice feature with the electrolyzer is that you can actually go below that line and have a sort of above 100% efficiency, then you need, of course, to supply the missing energy in the form of heat. There's a long uh, uh, entropy argument behind this that I will not uh, touch upon today. Not that I didn't like to do that, but we don't have time for it. So uh, we have this, these are the families, and, and then we will see that the PEM electrolyzer is more efficient than the alkaline electrolyzer, and that is often claimed. But in reality, they are just operated at a, an acceptable or efficiency, and that would be somewhere within this, uh, this uh, shape that I've, I've added now called normal operation. So if you compare the, the actual efficiency, conversion efficiency of PEM and alkaline systems, they are very much the same. It is just that the PEM system has such a much higher uh, uh, rate capability, so you can do with a much, much smaller uh, system, and that makes it very attractive, of course. So if we look at the traditional alkaline technology and with the focus on the cost and scalability challenges that we face uh, for the alkaline, it, it is basically, first of all, the, the low production rate, and in other words, the large footprint. These electrolyzers are very large. This is one from the uh, Swiss company AHT, AHT, which is now acquired by Sunfire recently. Uh, they're very large, but they're very robust, and they can operate for uh, decades with hardly any maintenance. Uh, the new boy in class here uh, of commercial electrolyzers, like the PIM electrolyzer, which has been gained very high popularity because it's so much more compact and has a lot of advantages. Uh, it's really a nice system, but it also has some challenges that we have heard a little about already with the noble metals. The catalysts are noble metals, and uh, to my understanding, there are many groups trying to, to solve that problem or replace uh, the noble metal catalyst, but uh, we haven't seen that uh, happening yet. So we still are stuck with uh, iridium and, 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 and platinum. There are also noble metal coatings on the internal parts to, to uh, avoid uh, corrosion and, and, and the uh, plates and, and the post transport layer, the electrode structures are normally made of titanium. So it's all quite expensive materials. And the scalability is affected by that, in, in particularly the iridium, where uh, Kalisher uh, made a nice outline of that, uh, the, the low production, annual production. And, and, and you can uh, make some back of an envelope calculations uh, and we will come to the result that the, the fraction of electrolysis, if we go to the terawatt scale, will be very, very small uh, because it is uh, limited by iridium. So we'll make the electrolysis out of all the iridium available. We'll ban jewelry, 
I do that, and I think that is very nice. And when space is important, we check the payment enterprises. But for the really large scale implementation, uh, we need uh, to, to develop the, the, the Alka line. It actually works, it's just very large. And since it's very large, and even if the materials are inexpensive, you need a lot of it. And then eventually the uh, cost uh, comes up. So uh, if we um, compare some of these uh, key uh, properties here, we have for the alkaline, we have the, 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 the problem of, of rate capability. I also call it efficiency. It should be, be uh, effectiveness. Uh, they have to be large in the footprint. That's the drawback. And for the PIM, it is the, the cost. Uh, the actual system, for the actual system, the cost is not much higher for the PEM because you, you can do with much less of it if the rate capability is three to four times higher, then you can pay three, four times more for it. So per producing power, uh, they are actually quite comparable. PEM is slightly more expensive, but not so much. Uh, but we have these uh, cost issues with, with the you noble know, metals and the scalability. Uh, limitation also. So it is tempting to look at just the green uh, words here and say, can we get this in, in one system? And uh, we believe we can do that. Uh, then we have to look at what limits, uh, what, what gives the red uh, writing. And for the for the high cost, it is a noble and expensive metals, uh, especially the, the medium for, that limits the scalability. And in the alkaline system, the big problem is the internal resistance. So that's why the polarization curves, the voltage current profile rises so sharply, because as soon as you increase the current, you have a, a ohmic uh, loss, uh, that's Ohm's law, basically, in the membrane. And that is not uh, so pronounced at low current densities, but at high current densities, this is the main source of, of losses and, and heat evolution. So we could do, we could get a better uh, membrane in that case, uh, it would be uh, very advantageous. For the electrodes and, and, and catalysts, uh, there is a much larger uh, variety of materials that can be used in the, uh, in the alkaline system. In the acidic system, the PIM system is acidic. Uh, it is practically only uh, iridium uh, so far, uh, perhaps with some ruthenium as well, but ruthenium alone uh, dissolves. So it's platinum and iridium. And, and, and despite uh, years of trying, we have not found a solution to that. But in the alkaline system, uh, we can do with uh, basically plain nickel, but uh, some uh, uh, materials with, with, with uh, other components uh, are actually even better. Uh, of course, there's a lot of work to be done here also. We know that the old fashioned electrolysis with pure nickel can, can operate for decades. So the degradation is very really small, but if we make advanced system, uh, we need to address that and make sure they will last. So for the for the catalyst, uh, there are a lot of opportunities to be to be uh, uh, checked out. Then for 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 the for the membrane, uh, we see there are basically three ways to go. The diaphragm is the porous membrane used today. It's quite thick to have a reasonable uh, separation of the gases and to have a high uh, bubble point. And that gives a uh, quite high resistance uh, because of the thickness. So the state of art material the here front is a half a millimeter thick. The dream is to make an anion exchange membrane uh, like the one in, in PEM electrolyzers where you have a, a system with side chains uh, with immobilized ions, and then you can make uh, wedded uh, hydrophilic domains that conducts the, the ions. You can see that as a kind of, of a nanoporosity uh, filled with, with, with uh, water and ions. The third way that we're pursuing in the projects mainly is the ion solvating membrane. Here we don't have any pores, we just have a membrane material that can dissolve the electrolyte and all the ions and water and everything. So you have a sort of blend of membrane and electrolyte with a very high conductivity. Um, and it's like you can see uh, the the Traditional idea to the left with the AM, we have these side chains, and that's actually the weak part of the polymers typically. So that is where it's degraded first, these side chains. And if we, it loses them, it loses the conductivity. So that's the beginning of the end. Uh, we don't have these side chains. We just have 
polymer materials yet, exemplified by the polymer polybenzimidazole uh, that we have used a lot and uh, Blue World is using for fuel cells, then it's doped with acid, and you get this uh, acid and uh, acid and, and polymer uh, mix that is highly conductive. That's phosphoric acid you can go to very high temperatures because it doesn't evaporate as easily as, as water. And we can also dope it with uh, in the alkaline system with uh, aqueous KOH, and then we get an alkaline uh, uh, ion conductor. And that works uh, famously, but uh, the stability of the TBI in the alkaline system is not good enough as we know it. So that's one of the things that we're looking at in the project. How can we improve that? Also, we make other uh, completely different polymers with high alkaline stability and also the hydrophilicity it takes to suck up the, the electrolyte and form the ions of the aging membrane. Uh, looking briefly at the electrode development, uh, well, the rule number one, no platinum molybdenum. Uh, we are looking at uh, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional structures. Actually, all the electrodes are three-dimensional, but some are based on a, a plate. Uh, where you add some catalytic uh, layers, a uh, perforated plate, that is a common way to do it. But we're also looking at the 3D structures where you can get a, a much higher uh, surface area and, and utilization of the membrane, there'll be no blind spots. Uh, so that is under development. Uh, we are uh, pursuing different manufacturing techniques. DLR is using plasma spraying, and the University of Louvain is uh, using other techniques uh, on substrates and, and even uh, 3D printing of the electrode. So that's also very exciting. Uh, when we have this concept with the ions are written membrane, we need to have the, cat the electrolyte everywhere. So we don't, uh, we don't need any other uh, phases for transporting the ions. So we don't need any anomalies in the catalyst layer. That also simplifies things because that's typically what breaks down first uh, in alkaline ion exchange membrane-based fuel cells and electrolyzers. And then we'll do some upscaling so we can, uh, we can uh, demonstrate it in a, uh, a nail electrolyzer towards the end. We uh, base this on, on some, some early studies uh, of the ion exchange membrane. And we have uh, a few years ago, uh, together with uh, DLR and Julis, uh, which are also partners of the project, uh, published a study where we showed that with the ion exchange membrane, we can actually get PEM performance uh, with an alkaline system. And that is uh, sketched on, 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 this, on this graph, uh, the one from before, and the new orange line here is what, what we have measured. Uh, the big uh, issue here is to uh, improve and verify uh, the long-term stability. So that's the main target uh, in this. And that goes for both membranes and, and advanced electrodes. The structure of the project is like this. We have membrane electrode development and uh, some testing and upscaling. And then the, the best materials will go to, to the demonstration in the electrolyzer. And besides that, we'll do durability uh, testing of, of the best materials uh, in the lab. We do not have time to test uh, long-term durability with the full-size electrolyzer. But that will have to come in the future. Looking at it uh, another way, we can say that sorry, uh, we can say that we have different technologies for fuel cell for 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 membranes and electrodes and and, and their testing and and benchmarked, and then we uh, we choose the best ones for the upscaling. That's a pretty traditional, and in parallel to that, we'll keep developing the materials all the way to the end of the project. We we'll also have some trial integration with some uh, standard materials that we have already, and we put that into the electrolyzer to, to uh, solve the problems of, 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 of uh, integrating the new materials. And the nice thing here is that the electrolyzer is already there. So as soon as we have either electrodes or membranes that are better than what is there, they can be implemented uh, very fast, we believe. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and of course acknowledge uh, the project Next AC that uh, is behind all this. That's a homepage to the uh, link to the homepage of the project. It is not uh, very developed yet, but uh, we will uh, elaborate on that uh, in the very near future. And then you can see.
And before I shut completely up, uh, I have one bonus slide for you with uh, our international conference on neutrologies that were initiated in Copenhagen some years ago. Uh, continued in Norway, uh, in a very beautiful uh, mountainous area, and uh, it should have been held in Golden Colorado at Colorado School of Mines this year, but for obvious reasons, we had to postpone it to next year. So stay tuned, and, and uh, if you're interested in trolleys, that will be the place to be in late June next year. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jens. Um, I would like to give the opportunity to the attendees uh, to let us know if they have any, any questions before moving to the next uh, and final presentation. And yes, we see we have a question coming from Le uh, Lesio. Are there options for disposal or recycling of the development system discussed in the project? I'm sure they are. Uh, it is not something we have uh, looked into in this project. That's not really part of it. Uh, one could argue that since we are not using the high cost materials, the uh, economic uh, driving force is not so so strong, but, but it's certainly something that we need to address uh, for other reasons. Uh, the alkaline system is to a large extent based, based on nickel, and that should be uh, recyclable. Uh, depending on, on what's underneath, uh, stainless steel probably. Uh, so, uh, so that is probably that's something that, that certainly should be addressed uh, in general for, for alkaline electrolysis. For the membrane, uh, we hope to uh, do without uh, fluorine chemistry, which will uh, ease the disposal or, or uh, uh, incineration of, of the membrane materials afterwards. Okay, we uh, thank you so much, James. We do not have more questions. Um, so I guess it's time to introduce uh, our last speaker, uh, Daniel Garcia from, uh, from DLR. Welcome, Daniel. The floor is yours. So feel free to share the screen. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, Pablo. Um, good morning, everybody. Could you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, perfect. Then I will start. Uh, thank you again for, for giving us this uh, opportunity to introduce our project, uh, Promethage 2. This project uh, has received the funding from the European Commission in the Pan Horizon 2020 in the research and innovation actions. Our project has started in the last uh, year in April, and we will have three years to develop our project. Okay. Today, I will start uh, introducing our project uh, briefly, the main targets uh, we have, uh, the main uh, goals, and also the strategy that we will follow to overcome these uh, um, targets. And uh, after this, I will, uh, present our consortium in Prometage 2. It's a quite a, a strong consortium. Then I will move for the details, um, specific details, I think, to understand what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. And last but not least, I will present some of the first results we have in the project. At this point, I have to ask you for patience because, of course, uh, we are pending for uh, publications and patents and all the information cannot be disclosed. But I recommend you to take one eye on our page because all the open public uh, publication will be there. So let's uh, start with um, with a project. Um, we wanted to to find an alternative way to produce methanol, um, and we wanted to do it in a competitive way with a fossil-based pathway. Yeah, we selected the green hydrogen as a key technology for us. And we'll produce the green hydrogen using uh, PEM water electrolyzers. I think in a pre uh, previous uh, presentation, uh, one of my colleagues, Forrest Leister, he uh, really uh, gave a very good introduction on how this technology works that I will not spend time with details about how uh, the PEM is working for produce hydrogen. Our goal is to decrease the capital cost in this uh, PEM water electrolyzer. Uh, we wanted to go from the 1,000, 1,500 euro kilowatt that was present in the state of the art when we did the submission of the proposal 
and we wanted to go down to 500, 750 euro kilobytes. And of course, we wanted to do this, maintaining the standard of efficiency and also the durability. How we will do this, um, we wanted to replace completely or have a thermal reduction of the critical raw material. We will point the catalyst and protective coatings with our main goals. And we also wanted to replace the titanium by a stainless steel as base material for manufacture the PTLs and, and Bipro components. We also wanted to explore new membranes. And also we wanted to improve um, the PEM technology at the stack level and also in the balance, balance of plan. I think uh, uh, if you see this graph, uh, you can understand really clearly what is our target and our objective. Um, we wanted to go from the red point that was the cause of the methanol, or the cause of the methanol when um, we make the, um, the proposal, we submit the proposal. And we wanted to go down to the green uh, point up that will be um, the cause of the methanol if we can um, overcome all the Prometage 2 targets. That means this is a way that we will be uh, really um, competitive with the fossil fuel based path. Then let me introduce our consortium. In Prometage 2, we are 12 partners. We count five for the Academy and seven industrial partner for six countries in Europe. Um, it means our project have a really good balance between the industry and the academy. Now I would like to show you what uh, uh, is doing every of our partners. We have uh, monolithos that will take care of the recycling aspect that is also really important for our project. We have Sandman, CNR and SASIC that will be developer of a catalyst, a new innovative catalyst. Kemurs will be developed the membranes. The PTLs and the bipolar plates and also on the male MEA level will be done by DLR and also by ULIG. We have a partner that will develop a new concept for a stack that is ProPulse. And we also need a one partner that uh, will have the system for this uh, stack that is eGas. We have also NEL on board. And in our project have a validation uh, role in this uh, scenario. Regarding the methanol production, this task is one of the important tasks is led by a liquid and also the life cycling um, assessment and evaluation of the cost will be done by the hydrogen uh, of Aragon. Then let me show you our approach more in details. As I say, we wanted to um, produce an extreme reduction of the critical raw material at the catalyst level. Now we will focus only on the catalyst level. We will follow two different routes. One is the completely replacement of this critical, uh, critical raw material, that is critical raw material free. This we call that this a high risk route. And to do that, uh, we will use for the oxygen evolution reaction, um, silver based catalyst. And for the hydrogen evolution reaction, we will use catalysts based on ion and molybdenum sulfides and nitrites. We have a second, um, we guess a route that is a drastic reduction. To do that, uh, we want it uh, to follow. We will explore new materials that can produce the reduction of this uh, critical raw material specifically inside the iridium. And to do that, we will use uh, mixed oxides in the case of the cathode side, to reduce the critical raw material, we are working on palladium and platinum nanosheets. We also wanted to explore um, in this drastic reduction support materials. And to do that, we wanted to use a nanosite uh, for the oxygen evolution reaction. We wanted to use electrical conductive and a stable oxide uh, nanostructure. We wanted to, have, to explore one and two D morphologies. And on that, we will support iridium on iridium ruthenium oxides. And the cathode side, we will use uh, active carbides as support for reducing the platinum loading. At this point, I have to remark that uh, in our project, we wanted also to explore the recycling strategies and all these um, inputs from the recycling will be introduced in our circle uh, economy uh, evaluation. 
regarding the membranes, um, we will develop uh, new membranes uh, thanks to to have a more the Kemur, that is a well-known uh, company, will develop membranes based on NAFION. Our main goal will be to minimize uh, on the proton transport, uh, to improve the stability, and to reduce the thickness. Also, we wanted to reduce the, grass, the gra gas crossover, of course, and also we will explore uh, suitable fillers like radical scamberges, also recombination catalysts, to enhance the gas uh, crossover to enhance, to protect the ga gas crossover. We also wanted to explore new reinforcements um, in order to have uh, more uh, stable membranes. Regarding the PTLs, uh, pore transfer layers, and the biporal plays, um, I think this is one of the key um, of our project because, as you know, this represents almost 60% of the cost of the stack. Then, if we can uh, reduce the cost here, we can reduce the cost overall of the stack. We wanted to replace the titanium, that is the base material for this kind of component, by a stainless steel. And then we will have an extreme production of the critical raw material using protective coating. To do this, we will use the vacuum plasma, uh, va vacuum plasma spraying technology. We will do um, different points. Uh, we will maintain the critical raw material in the minimum possible. We will coat it uh, with uh, non-critical raw material metals like titanium, molybdenum, and vanadium. And also one aspect that we wanted to explore is to go from vacuum plasma spraying to ambient pressure plasma spraying. With this, I think we will have a good reduction in the cost. I have to say that uh, at the moment that we did the submission, the titanium was not one of the was not in the list of the critical raw material for Europe. That's uh, only for advice if someone has something. But it's a really expensive material. In Prometage 2, we wanted only not only to explore materials. We only we also wanted to work on the stack development, and to do that, uh, we will have a new concept that is the hydraulic star compression. It's a novel technology that was uh, patented by Propulse. And um, the main advantage for this uh, new technique is that it's really modular. If has a chance to have high pressure of the hydrogen, it's possible to go to, uh, to 100 bars. We have a really homogeneous current distribution, homogeneous thermal distribution, and since that the mechanical stress are minimized. In addition, we also wanted to develop a new tool that is a segmented cell. It's not a new tool, it's an adaptation from the fuel cells to electrolysis. And this uh, tool will give us a chance to study locally the current density distributions and also the temperature distribution. This is really interesting when we are studying new materials at the stack level to explore and to see um, the degradation process at local level. I think this gives us a lot of information in fuel cells. And we believe that this is also a good tool for us for um, electrolysis. Regarding the system, we wanted to have at the end of the project uh, a stack of 25 kilowatts. Of course, to um, run the stack with uh, hydraulic cell compression, we need a specific system. Our output pressure will be in the project 40 bars with high purity of hydrogen. And also we claim that the balance of plan for the system component should be lower than the current state of the art. Regarding the methanol production, I think when we, once we have this cheap green hydrogen, we will couple this with CO2 to produce the reduction, and then we will storage in the form of methanol. I think this is a really interesting and important approach in which we have on the one half green hydrogen, we have the possibility to reduce the CO2, and we also have the possibility to storage in a liquid like methanol, that is a high value um, material. To do that, uh, we will uh, have two steps. Uh, the first one, we explore a baseline. It means we will charge the Prometheus 2 uh, stack with 25 kilowatts with a standard material. And with this, we will have a baseline in which we can compare the materials that we will develop afterwards in 
Promete H2. Then this is, will be a, a good point for right liquid to evaluate uh, all the costs uh, and also the input uh, for our project. Last but not least, I will conclude this presentation uh, showing you the first results of, uh, of the project. I think this is uh, one important point to show that we are working and we have a good results on that. First of all, we start with the critical raw material free at the anode side for the oxygen evolution reaction. This work was developed by the partner CNR. And as you can see in the left uh, graph, we have a polarization curve of this kind of material. It means this polarization curve represents a MEA that was uh, loaded with non platinum groove metal at the anode side. As you see, the performance are not so high, but are quite promising in terms of stability. I think this is the start point, and I think is more investigations need to be done, but I think it's a good start point. Regarding the critical raw material free for the cathode side for the hydrogen evolution reaction, we will use a, a molybdenum sulfide. This work was done by uh, the catalyst was developed by the SASIC and also the membrane or the MEA was uh, prepared by Ulich. In this graph here in the left side, you can see the comparison between the reference that is uh, loaded with platinum and the performance with these uh, molybdenum sulfides at two different loads. One is 0 0.7 milligram per square centimeter, and the other is two milligram per square centimeters. We observe that we don't have so much difference or it's not dependent for the loading we apply. It's clear that we still have a gap between the platinum group metal and the platinum group metal free electrodes. Next, I would like to show the work that uh, was developed uh, by Ulich. In this case, um, Ulich wanted to uh, work on the active layer and he, uh, they develop um, some techniques to try to reduce as much as they can the load of the iridium oxide. In the left side graph, uh, you can see um, how low loadings can work and can achieve a, a really good performance. Uh, even we achieved the target from Promet H2 regarding the loading. I would like to direct your attention to the orange um, curve that is um, a precision curve that was loaded only with 0 0.23 um, milligram square centimeters of iridium. That is a very, very low compared with the current state of the art. Regarding the durability, of course, we have here a little issue. And after a test of 500 hours, uh, we can observe that when we have a uh, very low loading, that is the orange graph, we have a gap between the beginning of the test and the end of the test. This uh, gap in durability in performance was not observed when we have a high loading. In this case, we compare 0 0.2 milligrams square centimeter of iridium with a 2.2 milligram uh, of iridium. In this case, we don't have this durability gap and uh, currently we are working on make this uh, low loading more durable and also understand the mechanism, the process that are involved on that because I think we, we believe that it's really important to know what is happening in order to avoid this degradation. Now I would like to show you um, one of uh, our best results at the moment that we can show. This is a work that was developed by SASIC and also we cooperate in this, in the preparation of the MEAs and also in the testing. This is a new material, new catalyst uh, for the oxygen evolution reaction. It's a iridium mixed. And we can see here in the left side, it's compared with iridium black, with one milligram of iridium black. It's one of the more active catalysts that we know in electrolysis. And we see how our um, catalyst uh, go in a good way. It means we are down of under our goal, our target in Promet H2. And we have a really good performance even if we catch charge uh, with 0 0.2 milligrams of iridium square centimeters 
of course, one of the questions here is how durable it is. And then we did in a test in MEA, and we observed that uh, these catalysts have a really great uh, durability. We tested almost 500 hours without a very high degradation. Then it's one of the most promising catalysts uh, for the moment. We have also other promising catalysts that we are uh, now testing. And this uh, will be published soon. Um, I hope um, we will do the submission soon. And I think um, you will have all the details about this catalyst uh, also soon. Regarding our work in the uh, membranes development, we have, uh, thanks to the Chemours, the, they develop one membrane from Prometage 2. This call it the MP, uh, NDP8003. Uh, it's here in the, in the left side graph in blue. This work was developed also in cooperation with ULIC. ULIC uh, have the three different membranes and they have ex exactly the same CCNs produced and they test it. And you can see here and that uh, um, the new membrane produced or have a really good performance close to the thinner membranes of Nafion 212. And regarding the hydrogen crossover, the behavior is more close to uh, thicker membranes like the Nafion 117. I think it's a really promising membrane. And also with these results, we, uh, we achieved the target from Prometage 2 regarding the membranes. Now I would like to show you some of the results uh, we have for the reduction of the critical raw materials at the PTL level. In this case, of course, we are uh, we submit the the work, uh, but we are pending. That's why we cannot uh, disclose so much information about. But um, again, soon we will have. Uh, I hope we will have a completely report, and you can uh, check uh, in it. In this case, we are uh, producing the coating of the microporous layer, and we use. Um, stainless steel PTLs and we will cover with uh, oil coating with vacuum plasma sprayer. In some of them, the last one, uh, ULIC uh, develop um, or apply a very, very thin uh, layer of critical raw material in order to reduce the passivation. And uh, we can compare the coating PTLs made on titanium, the PTLs uh, with our coating um, with a stainless steel and here, the last is the one with a stainless steel, our coating, and also the anti-passivation layer uh, produced by ULIC. If you wanted to know more details about this passivation layer, I recommend you to read this publication. As you see from the graph, we have almost 300 uh, millivolts uh, different uh, drop in the, in the potential of the polarization curve that I think is quite high more because these uh, materials are based on stainless steel and are much more cheaper than the ones made on based on titanium. I will conclude this presentation today. Uh, so in the recycling activities uh, in Promethe H2, um, this work has been developed by Monolithos. Monolithos have a best experience uh, in the recycling of the um, automotive catalyst. They use a hydrometallurgical process. Uh, if you wanted to know more details about how they are applying this uh, method, uh, I recommend you to read this uh, publication. And they have a very high level of recovery um, in the pal platinum, palladium, and rhodium. You can see here, very high level. In our project, uh, they wanted to explore this technology, but also for a PEM water electrolyzer. I think they, they did a really great job. You can see here um, the publication in which they saw how they do the, the process and how they apply the hydrometallurgical process to the uh, PEM water electrolyzer. And we have some uh, data that say that uh, the leaching efficiency for the platinum is uh, approximately 100%. It's recovered completely the platinum. This platinum can be reused for recasting new MEAs. Also, uh, they observe that the nafion can be also reprocessed and reuse it for uh, catalyst ledger as ionomer and also for recasting new membranes. 
And currently we are waiting uh, for um, a currency um, number for the Iridium uh, recovery. I think for my side, uh, this is all. And I have to thank you again, uh, Paolo, for this really nice uh, workshop. Uh, if you have some uh, questions, I will be glad to, to answer. And I recommend you to uh, follow us in our homepage. And it's in this page when we will update all the new publication that will be in open access. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. We actually have a few questions. Um, the last one we have is, um, what is the presumed cost of CO2 uh, to arrive at fossil fuel parity? I'm not sure if I understood correctly the, the question. I mean, it's, um... If you go to the chat, just in case you need to read it, it's okay. um, before the last one. I mean, this is something like uh, it's quite early to, to tell, and this is something like the people from Aliquid uh, should answer. But um, you can write me an email and I will forward them a complete. But I think it's uh, a little bit uh, early to, to answer this in the terms of the Prometh 2 project. The only maybe we can share with the person is the approaches that we did during the preparation of the project. This is something like uh, should be not a problem. Okay. Another question say, what is the main reason of not using SOAC? What are the disadvantages of SOAC compared with the uh, PEMEC? Okay, well, this is a, a good question. I mean, SOAC have uh, also a good potential, uh, but uh, our point of view, we prefer the PEM technology because uh, for us, uh, I think, works better in the terms of uh, big coupling with the renewable um, path and also in terms of export new materials uh, for us is uh, easy it means we have also in our group a division for working for sofc but uh, we are uh, working on uh, pen uh, water electrolyzers that's why and the last question we we got is um you gave a, a cost target Oh, sorry. You gave a cost target for methanol. How did you arrive at this? It means uh, this is something that was developed uh, during the, pros, uh, the project preparation to, uh, for our partners that are involved on the evaluation of the cost. And we plant, uh, we give some scenarios about the cost that we have uh, currently and with the technology that we wanted to implement and with this, uh, we have uh, approximately this cost, uh, comparing the scenarios that we, we have some points about how the, the price is almost for the hydrogen. And with this, uh, we achieve uh, that uh, when the reduction with different scenarios from Promet H2 will be achieved, we will have this uh, value of the cost of the methanol. Okay, the last question, Daniel says, I know it's too early in the project, but what is your prelim preliminary feeling about the stainless steel coatings in, in proton exchange membrane water electrolyzer? It means uh, it's early, but of course, uh, as I saw in the last uh, one of the last, last slides, uh, we have a really good, uh, a really good uh, feeling. It means uh, it's something like uh, our group uh, was really active uh, working and we have publication and also we will have one uh, new that so that it could be a stable in time and also can be really competitive uh, with the titanium ones. Then it's, of course, I'm really clumsy. Okay, I think we have time for mo one more question. Do you recycle uh, PGM only hydrometallurgically or also pyrometallurgically? I think for the moment, this is a question that Monolitos should answer this, but I think for the project, for the moment, we are only using the hydrometallurgical process, but it's something like we are not close, but we have maybe to ask the people from Monolitos. Okay. I saw that some of, I think Erini was also here. 
Yes. Hello. Hi. I'm hi hi. My name is Agoreu, and I'm a R and I scientist from Olthos. Yes, uh, we were using uh, our head metallurgical leaching method, and uh, as uh, Dr. Daniel Garcia shows, uh, we have um, very interesting results. So we will uh, continue with the. Uh, with this method, and we were trying to, to examine uh, different experimental conditions, such as uh, the temperature and the um, acidity of uh, the hydrochloric acid solution that were, that were using in order uh, to optimize uh, the, and develop a fast and versatile and environmental friendly hydrometallurgical uh, process for recycling PGMs uh, with high yields. Okay, we just get the, the last question before we get to the wrap up and conclusions uh, that says, in the cost of methanol into the project, what percentage comes from green H2 and what from capture CO2? Okay, I think again, this is uh, one of the questions that uh, the people from uh, Liquid uh, should, uh, should answer. I think none of them are here, but also if you write me an email, I will forward the the, this question and I will give you a percent of the green hydrogen and the capture CO2 in percent. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for such an inspiring presentation also. Uh, we would like to fin uh, uh, to conclude our workshop uh, by giving some wrap up and conclusions. Um, So how could we summarize uh, the four sessions or the four projects or what are the final conclusions that we are looking for behind these four initiatives? Uh, first one is that the, the batteries may not be the best solution to face all energy storage need due to the cost, safety and environmental issues. Um, however, the non-battery based storage technologies, uh, such as the one that we have been discussing during today, can be suitable solutions for different energy storage needs. Uh, exchange solid oxys electrolysis cell with alkaline electrolysis can be also a, another option. Um, we basically know that sustainability energy production can only work well when the specific different energy storage challenges are solved. Advanced material solution may be high capacity, durable proton exchange membrane, and solid oxide electroly electrolysis cell uh, for hydrogen production or cost uh, efficiency in mat materials uh, for tanks for hydrogen storage. Uh, however, as you mentioned, the four projects mentioned, uh, the material must show its economic uh, viability, also considering the cost related to the necessary overall infrastructure. Uh, the strong development potential for proton exchange membrane electrolysis, uh, if the material cost and use of critical raw materials can be reduced, and picking the best of both alkaline and proton exchange membrane electrolysis may be game changing if successful. And another conclusion is that uh, one of the goals of Recyclize Arena Next A AEC um, Promet H2 is to improve technical and economic competi competitiveness of the European Union stationary storage production suitable to store large amount of energy by enabling low carbon um, energy production, helping to reach climate goals and CO2 reduction uh, levels. So that's um, basically one of uh, the, the, the main conclusions uh, of our workshop. But again, I would like to give the opportunity to do final question or anything you would like to, to know before conclude uh, our workshop. So I don't know if you have, uh, you have the chat option in case you want to add something. If not, I would like to inform you that uh, this webinar has been recorded and we will post the, the recording of the session uh, during this week or beginning of the, of the next week. Uh, so please, we invite you to follow our social media channels, uh, Recycleize, Arena, 
next AEC and Prometheus 2 to keep tune of the of the upcoming news. Um, and in order, and if you want to 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 see again or to share this webinar, uh, you will have the possibility to to do it. Um, as I see, there is no questions. Uh, I think it's time to to conclude our uh, workshop. I would like to thank uh, Soren, uh, Jens, Christian, uh, Daniels, uh, and Jose Luis for such an amazing uh, presentations. Um, and thank you one more time because we have been working on this workshop during a uh, lot of months and i'm very uh, very happy to to see that many of you have been interacting giving some interact um, very interesting questions and uh, we have been exchanging some very useful information so thank you again the four of you um, and let's keep in tune in social media thank you pablo bye bye thank you pablo bye bro